of um, an 18th century house, number 80 St. Stephen's Green, which was built for Robert Clayton. He was the Bishop of Kalala and later was promoted to the Bishop of Cork and Ross and decided then to build a townhouse for himself here in Dublin. And just to give you a little bit of historical context, can you hear me by the way? Oh, yes. Good. Um, by the end of the 17th century, land ownership had completely changed here in Ireland. The Native Irish were basically tenants in their own homeland. They'd lost everything, there was various plantations, etc. So now we have a situation where you have a majority population being ruled by a minority, upper class ascendancy. So to keep them down and in place and to keep them from getting involved in rebellions, etc., penal laws were introduced. And these took away all the rights from the Native Irish for religious, um, all their civil rights, etc. So they couldn't even vote on land, leases were restricted, they couldn't teach, be educated. Um, they uh, couldn't practice their religion. So while the Native Irish were busy surviving, <coughs> the city started to develop. Um, and there's a move away from building big fortified dwellings into these grander sort of townhouses, country homes, big estates. And this was one of the first <coughs> houses to be built in this part of the city on St. Stephen's Green. Um, Robert Clayton employed the services of an architect called Richard Cassells, or Castle. Now his origins were probably German. He came to work in Ireland in uh, 1729, and by 1736 he was busy designing this house. Um, it was described as one of the grandest houses of its day, and in fact a social commentator at the time, or gossip columnist as she probably would be now, a Mrs <laughs> Delaney, came to visit the house and she, she described it as being magnifique. She said the bishop and his lady were remarkable people and she said that they were um, very good at entertaining. She said they kept a very handsome table with six plates of meat constantly at dinner and six plates for supper. So I hope you enjoy the hospitality of all these places. <laughs> how, how, how does a Catholic bishop have a lady? Pardon? How does a Catholic bishop have a lady? He wasn't a Catholic bishop. Good question, because by now, as I said, we're completely under British rule, and the established church of the state was the Anglican church. Catholics for a long time couldn't even practice their religion. So he's an Anglican bishop, and therefore can marry. This is the Dublin of Jonathan Swift. Have you heard of the author of Gulliver's Travels, yep. Modest Proposal? Yep. He's up in St. Patrick's Cathedral at this stage, uh, busy writing all these marvelous satirical works. Um, the, the house later, after the death of the bishop and subsequently his wife, was bought by the um, Earl of Mount Cashel. And for the next 40 years or so, it was known as Mount Cashel House. It was then bought by the Honourable um, John Philpott Curran, who was a barrister, he was a parliamentarian, he was the master of the rolls. He had defended uh, members of the 1798 rebellion, the, the United Irishmen. This was the only rebellion of the 18th century, by the way, the one at the end, which was influenced by the success of the French and <coughs> American revolutions. And his daughter, Sarah, was engaged to another patriot, Robert Emmett who uh, was executed in 1803 after a failed rebellion. He was hanged and beheaded on Thomas Street, very close to the Guinness Brewery. Um, there were a couple of more owners, and eventually, in 1852, <coughs> the property was acquired by Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness. He was the sole owner of the Guinness Brewery. He was a member of Parliament. He had been the Lord Mayor of Dublin the previous year. And he bought number 80, and shortly after, bought the house beside at number 81. And he engaged the services of a Kerry-born architect whose name was uh, James Franklin Fuller to assist with the design of the new building. So the two houses were incorporated. Um, later on, number 79 and number 80 were built by Fuller at the side. And um, a ballroom was added which is where you're going to have dinner this evening, by a Glasgow architect called William Young towards the end of the 19th century. Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness was dead at this stage. The ownership had passed on to his son, the Earl of Ivy. 
first Earl of Ivy, who gave the house its current name, Ivy House. So this remained the property of the Guinness family right down until 1939, when Rupert Guinness, the second Earl, gave it to the Irish government as a gift. Now apparently his wife was very pleased about this because it said it eliminated the problem of having to secure nine housemaids to work in the house. The furnishings were then sold off the contents and in fact the, the auction catalogue tells us that there were 23 main bedrooms and 11 bachelor apartments in the house at the time. I'm not sure what the bachelor apartments were <laughs> used for but probably down the road to the local club you bring your what do we say your catch of the night home with you <laughs> who knows 22 of them but, uh, <laughs> all 22 of them so just to briefly some of the features of the house the staircase that you walked up to this um is all part of sort of the guinness restoration of the house and um this was part of the the um, work carried out by fuller two older staircases were incorporated to form this one. The original uh, wrought iron balustrades are incorporated here from the castle house. And the very first use of aluminium in Ireland, or aluminium as it's called as well, uh, can be seen in the staircase. The entrance hall has some beautiful uh, wooden carvings and high relief that depict scenes from Homer's Iliad. Um, this room that we're standing in is the music room, which has, I suppose, a magnificent ceiling. This is one of the most important feature of the house. And this music room, it's, I suppose, chamber music would be the theme. We've got a French horn, there's a recorder, um, there's a flute, there's music books. And you've got all these sort of swags of foliage and thrilling birds, as they're described around the plaster work. Some bits of these are missing because of the Guinness um, parties and banquets and the popping of champagne corks <laughs> off the ceiling. It's quite common. Um, the friezes are all sort of treated slightly differently. And then the carpets, by the way, on the floor, the carpets mostly throughout were designed by Raymond McGrath, who was the chief architect with the Office of Public Works in the 1950s and they come from Donegal. Kelly Beggs and Donegal hands not. There is one of these carpets in the White House, by the way. And then next door, the great salon with the main drawing room in the Clayton House. And it has a beautiful um, coved and coffered ceiling. Um, just to say that the paintings on the wall are by George Barrett, who was a landscape artist in the 18th century. These are scenes from Rome, mostly the ruins of the Colosseum, and um, there's a view of the Tivoli and the ruins of the Roman Forum. And the modern painting over the corner there is by Louis de Roque, one of the most important artists of the 20th century. If you go into the salon in the next room, you will see a portrait of Bishop Clayton, which was actually donated to the Irish Georgian Society by Adam Clayton. Is the name familiar? You too. You too. <laughs> Adam, no, no relation, but he bought the painting, gave it to the Irish Georgian Society, and in turn gave it to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Now, it is unusual that there's banquets like this held here. Mostly it's used for state entertainments and houses the Office of our Department of Foreign Affairs. So enjoy your evening. If you have any questions, please ask.